Hello, my name is Warren Perkins. I'm the Director of Academic Integrity for Swansea University. In this video, I'll give you an overview of academic integrity and how to avoid academic misconduct. What is academic integrity? This refers to the authenticity of the work submitted in order to achieve your degree. It must be your own work. It must reflect your reading and study and your own thoughts and ideas. So that when you've completed your studies, you will have earned your degree and others will be confident that you understand your discipline. If you're going into hospital to have an operation, you want to know that the surgeon who's about to perform that operation understands anatomy and didn't have to cheat in their anatomy exam because they didn't know where all the bits go. So why is it important? It maintains standards. It maintains the reputation of the university. Not something that you may immediately be concerned about, but if somebody, when you're applying for a job, um, employers are looking at your CV, they will see Swansea University as the institution that has awarded your degree. If the university requires a poor reputation for cheating, that will adversely affect the views of people who are looking at your qualifications. So it's important to maintain academic integrity so that your degree is recognised as being of a high standard and that your degree is worth having and to ensure that everyone is treated fairly in achieving their degree. Academic misconduct occurs when the principles and values of academic integrity are not adhered to. And this includes any attempt to gain an unfair advantage in any assessed work. So far, the, the language has been quite flowery. Basically, what we're talking about here is cheating. The university's definition of academic misconduct is that it is academic misconduct to commit any act whereby a person may attempt to obtain for himself, herself, or any other person an unpermitted advantage. And there's a link on the slide there to the MyUni site where the full regulations are laid out. So as an exercise then, I want you to think of the first few words that come to mind when you hear the following name. Lance Armstrong. Well, some of you may have thought, who's that? I hope most of you have heard of the name and those who have had who have heard of Lance Armstrong, I'm sure amongst the top few words that came into your mind were cheat and drugs. If you aren't aware of the story, Lance Armstrong uh, was a professional cyclist. He finished first in seven Tour de France races after having beaten uh, cancer, only to be found to have been doping and stripped of his titles. So the things that people remember are the cheating and the drugs. People who know the story more will remember that he beat cancer and he set up a foundation that has done a lot of charitable work to support cancer uh, sufferers. But for most people, the things that are remembered are his drug taking. The sporting analogy I like because we, Len leads us to the questions of who, who lost out. Now, I watched the, the Tour de France in those years. I didn't lose anything from the fact that he was uh, on drugs. It was his competitors who lost out, the other people in the race. So when we're talking about academic misconduct in a university setting, it's not the university who's losing out if people cheat. It's the other people on that course because they will be the people who are likely to be having their CVs compared with the person who's been cheating when they're applying for jobs. That's where the competition comes in, 
in this context. What damage did it do to cycling? Well, there's a lot of scandal, a lot of uh, sponsors pulled out, and now a lot of people will look at any cyclist who's performing well and at the back of their mind will be thinking, I wonder if they're clean. In the academic context, as I say, that would be the equivalent of the university getting a bad reputation for, for cheating, for academic misconduct, and any time an employer looked at a CV which had a Swansea degree on it at the back of their mind, thinking, I wonder if that person cheated. Clearly, that is not a situation we want to be in. And that is why we work very hard to maintain the, the academic integrity of all of our qualifications. So let's look at some examples. In examinations, you will probably be familiar with most of the rules and regulations here about not taking in books or notes or any communication devices, copying from other people, communicating with other people. Uh, there's some that you may not have uh, thought of. Uh, it's an offence to impersonate another person in an exam. It's also an offence to pre present evidence of extenuating circumstances which is falsified and presenting as your own work any material produced by unauthorised means. The full exam regulations are laid out uh, on the My Uni pages and you should check those thoroughly before uh, you have your first formal examination. Before then, you will probably be performing quite a lot of coursework and there are various issues that arise there which you may not uh, have heard discussed before. So the first of those I want to talk about is plagiarism. Now this is using another person's work or ideas without appropriate acknowledgement and submitting it for assessment as though it was your own work. Now this can refer to anything, any published work, concepts, ideas, data, graphs, equations, theories, anything that somebody else has produced, if you refer to it, you should state where that material has come from and who did the work in the first place. So examples of plagiarism, uh, using other people's words without due acknowledgement, that, i.e. You, you should be using quotation marks or some equivalent and a reference. Summarising the ideas, judgments, software, diagrams of another person without due acknowledgement. Or submitting another student's work as though it was your own. Collusion. Uh, is when two or more people work together without the prior and specific instruction of the member of staff responsible for the assessment to obtain, to obtain for him or herself or any other person an unpermitted advantage. Obviously, if, you, if the module or the assessment is specifically group work and you're told to work in groups, then working within that group is permitted, but otherwise, for individual assessment, you should be working on your own. So examples of collusion, students working together to produce substantially similar submissions and submitting the resulting work as being of sole authorship, loaning completed work to another student. You should be very careful with your work. Now it's only natural if your friend comes to you and says, I'm struggling with this. Uh, to want to help them. If you give them your work and they copy it, they've committed academic misconduct by copying the work and you have committed academic misconduct by providing them with work to copy. Uh, it's also another example is sharing the results of laboratory work, field work or any other form of data collection or analysis without authorization. Data fabrication is an offence. Uh, the integrity of any data we present is vitally important. Falsifying data anywhere, whether that's in a, an essay, a lab book, a report, a poster, wherever, is an offence. 
and penalties are severe. For a first offence, the standard penalty is zero for the whole module. Now this could result in the inability to proceed in your studies as you'll need to achieve a certain number of credits to progress. Serious or repeat offences can result in the student being withdrawn from the university and not allowed to return to further study. There is a more cynical form of academic misconduct, which we refer to as commissioning. And this refers to students who choose to submit work that was produced by somebody else as though it were the student's own work. This includes using uh, bespoke essay purchase sites, essay exchange sites, engaging any third party to produce work for you. And where students are found to have done this, the normal penalty is disqualification from the university. Proofreading uh, may be per is permitted by some colleges, but not others. So you should check with your college to see if they permit pr proofreading. If your college does permit proofreading, then it must be in line with the university's proofreading policy. And there's a link there to the My, My Uni site where this is laid out in full detail. To give you an overview, the following are not permitted as proofreading. Editing the text, rewriting elements of the work, altering the meaning or the content of the work, translating the work, offering advice about what to add or leave out of the work, and checking or correcting facts, data, formulae or equations. If you have your work proofread, you must keep the original email or written request to the proofreader, an electronic copy of the work before proofreading was taken place. This would apply even if the original work is not written in English or Welsh. An electronic copy of the work that has been proofread where the suggested amendments are clearly delineated. Any receipt or evidence of payment for professional services. And you must be prepared to provide this evidence upon request. When submitting the work, you must acknowledge that the work has been proofread by another person and that the proofreader has acted within the guidelines set out in the university proofreading policy. You can include this in the front sheet attached to your submitted work. Prevention, make sure you understand the rules, make sure you leave enough time for revision or to complete your coursework. Talk to your lecturer or academic mentor if you need help. Uh, help with study skills is also available from the Centre for Academic Success. Avoiding plagiarism. If you submit for assessment anything that includes the work of anyone else, make sure it is properly acknowledged. When talking about someone else's work in your own words, give a reference. When using someone else's words, use speech marks to clearly indicate the material taken from somewhere else and give a reference to show where it has come from. Similarly, if you use a diagram, data, figure, whatever it is from anywhere else, give a reference. If it's not yours, say whose it is. So let's look at an example. So here's a very short extract from an article by A. Smith and B. Jones in the Journal of Made Up Stuff, based on 2007 responses to an electronic survey circulated in March 2030, it was found that cats are 45.2% cuter than dogs. So if you were going to use this material and present it in your own words, for instance, you could say in a study Smith and Jones found that cats are cuter than dogs, then you need to give a reference. So the style I've used here is to put a one at the end and then in the bibliography the one 
would be attached to the reference A. Smith and B. Jones, Journal of Made Up Stuff, Volume 5, 2030, page 23. There are very, a range of different styles for providing the references, uh, depending which area you're working in, they will have different preferred formats. From the academic integrity perspective, as lot, the key thing is to ensure that there is a clear indication that this work has, this information has come from somewhere else. So here, so the one after the words says that that's a reference and we find the source in the bibliography. What are your own words? By this, we mean sentences that are constructed by you based on your understanding of the material. These are not someone else's sentences that have been tweaked. Uh, so this is not taking somebody else's sentence, reordering it a little bit, using synonyms for some of the words, minor linguistic changes like that. Those do not count as your own words. You need to construct your own sentences from the information in the source, not from the, the word, the sentences of the source itself. You could present this as a quotation. So using open quotes, 2007 responses to an electronic survey circulated in March 20, 2020, it was found that cats are 45.2% cuter than dogs, end quote with the one after it again has the reference. So here we have quotation marks clearly indicating that these words have been taken directly from the source. And there's a reference to tell us what that source is. Secondary sources. You may well find that somebody has answered a similar question to the one that you're looking at. They may well have done the work to find, read and process the primary sources. If you use a secondary source, that source must also be fully acknowledged so that the marker knows how much work you have done yourself. Simply giving references to the primary sources that you found inside that secondary source is not sufficient. Think about what, your, what the work presented is claiming you've done. If you present a dozen primary sources with analysis of those, that's saying that you have found a dozen sources, read them and analyzed them yourself. If in fact all you have done is find somebody else's work who's a secondary source and somebody else has done all of that work, that needs to be clear in your text or you are claiming credit for somebody else's work. If you have any questions or if you're in any doubt uh, about this, you should ask. Ask your lecturer, ask your academic mentor. They will be able to provide advice and assistance. Thank you.